Ethics in the NICU, Principles, Methods, and Applications by Dr. Mark Mercurio. Greetings. My name is Mark Mercurio. I'm the Chief of Neonatal Perinatal Medicine at Yale New Haven Children's Hospital and Director of the Program for Biomedical Ethics at Yale School of Medicine. Um, today we're going to talk for a bit about ethics in the newborn intensive care unit. Adequate fellowship training in ethics and professionalism is essential so that neonatologists can effectively approach and resolve ethical dilemmas that will inevitably occur. So what follows is just a basic review of some of the fundamental principles and approaches that are relevant to decisions in the newborn intensive care unit. So the objectives for this talk are first to understand the basic principles of medical ethics and how they apply specifically in the NICU setting. I recognize that for many of you these basic principles are review, but so we can all start on the same page, we're going to spend a few minutes going over those principles. I also want to specifically touch on the meaning, importance, and limits of parental authority, and finally to identify some practical strategies for resolving ethical conflicts in the NICU. Principle-Based Ethics There are four principles which are classically referred to as the fundamental principles of medical ethics. And they stem from something called the Belmont Report, which is now more than a generation old, and which have been uh, published in many places, most notably the classic text on ethics from Beecham and Childress. The principles are, one, respect for autonomy, sometimes referred to as respect for persons, two, beneficence, three, non-maleficence, and four, justice. These are, I should point out, prima facie obligations that we have, which means to say that they are obligations that could be overridden by other considerations, and sometimes by each other, as we'll see. Respect for autonomy. Autonomy literally translates as self-rule from the Greek auto and nomos. Um, it implies uh, a person's right to make decisions for him or herself. And autonomous decisions are informed and non-coerced. Beneficence refers to our obligation as physicians to act for the benefit of our patients, to promote their well-being. The third principle to touch on is non-maleficence which refers to the obligation not to harm. The physician's credo primum non nocere, first do no harm. And the way we harm patients in the medical setting, among other things, are causing pain, loss of dignity, financial loss, fear. Um, these can sometimes be justified by the needs of the patient. And beneficence may sometimes trump non-maleficence in our considerations of how best to act. Some uh, evidence of harm in the NICU will include pain associated with procedures, pulmonary damage associated with ventilators, parental anxiety, financial burden, disability that a child may be left with. Um, but it's important to recognize the old adage that the perfect is the enemy of the good. Specifically, if we say we can't actually get through a critical NICU course without some pain, that doesn't uh, relieve us of the obligation to try and minimize the pain that that child feels. We recognize that this can't be a pain-free experience from start to finish. Just like with a ventilator, we recognize that ventilators cause some measure of harm to the lungs. So, but we don't say because we know there's going to be some measure of harm, it doesn't matter how we do this, it's okay to overventilate, to overoxygenate, etc. Because the point is, we want to minimize those harms. We can't get perfect, but we still have an obligation to minimize the harms caused by our treatments. The fourth principle to touch on briefly is justice. And justice can be approached a couple different ways, but probably the most important way um, from Aristotle on is that equals should be treated equally. Put another way, if we're going to treat two patients differently, we need to identify a morally relevant difference. Now, what would those differences be? Well, traditionally in medicine, over the course of, of history, this might be ethnicity. We might say that one child is more worthy of treatment than another based on his ethnic background. Um, hopefully now you are all past that. Um, uh, again, similar obligations about gender, similar concerns about gender, or financial status. If we're treating patients differently, what's the morally relevant difference? I would argue, I think you would agree, that ethnicity may be a difference, but it's not morally relevant to deciding which patient deserves what. Um, nor is uh, gender in most cases, unless it becomes a morally relevant difference with sex-specific uh, illnesses. Financial status, the same. But we still struggle with this in modern medicine. Should a patient whose parents are a citizen uh, is that patient entitled to more than a patient whose parents are not citizens? These are differences you have to look at. These are differences. Are they morally relevant? Um, gestational age, is that a morally relevant difference? I'm going to suggest to you, and it's not this simple, but I'm going to suggest to you in this short period of time that prognosis is the most relevant difference when deciding which patient deserves a treatment, whereas another patient doesn't really warrant that treatment. That if we're going to treat people differently, we have to seek to identify a morally relevant difference. If we can't, 
then I think that there's a significant chance that we may be acting unjustly. We have to revisit our actions. Another aspect of justice to be considered is distributive justice, which refers to a fair allocation of scarce or limited resources. I mean, this is classically discussed in terms of organs for transplant. So it may be that all those other three principles dictate that a patient should get a treatment. For example, um, a heart transplant for an adult patient. If the patient wants it, the patient would clearly benefit from it. There may be harms associated with it, but they're relatively low compared to the benefit the patient could achieve. All these things are met. The patient still might not get the heart based upon an understanding of distributive justice, which is to say that's a limited resource, and therefore there may be someone else who is more deserving, has more of a claim on that resource than the patient in question. But it goes beyond simply organs for transplants. The issue of the limited resource could be something like NICU beds, could even be something like healthcare funds, which we have to come around to the understanding that this is a limited resource. Decision making. When autonomy is not an option, which is to say when a patient cannot speak for himself, a surrogate decision maker is designated to speak for the patient. In the case of an adult, this is typically a spouse, a parent, or an adult son or daughter. The surrogate decision maker is expected to reach their decision on behalf of the patient based not on what they think is best for the patient, not on what they think they would want if they were in that circumstance. Specifically, the standard is one of substituted judgment, not what would be best for a grandpa, but what do I think grandpa would want if he could speak to me now? What would grandpa have wanted? That's substituted judgment. That's the first standard, but of course it's not relevant in the newborn intensive care unit. When we're dealing with patients who have never been competent decision makers, what would they have wanted is not something that we can defer to. So we go to the next standard, which is the patient's best interest standard. And this is fundamental to an understanding of pediatric ethics. So it is the patient's best interest. Now the patient's best interests are measured essentially by balancing the benefits of the treatment in question against the burdens. If we're considering a specific treatment, if the benefits clearly outweigh the burdens, then it's in the patient's best interest to do this. If the burdens clearly outweigh the benefits, then it's not in the patient's best interest to do this. This is how we expect, we hope, that surrogate decision makers will decide for a patient who's never been competent. And this is how we'd like the parents, or whoever the guardian is for the kids in our unit, to reach their decisions. Understand that these are highly subjective assessments. You're often measuring the pain and difficulty of a treatment in a case that doesn't have an excellent chance for survival, and if there is survival, significant risk for long-term permanent disability. So measuring exactly when the burdens outweigh the benefits could be an extremely difficult thing and recognize that this is highly subjective. Now, if I were to say, to sum up medical ethics of the 20th century, put simply, we have gone over the course of the 20th century from beneficence as our principal ethic to autonomy, respect for autonomy. Now, this transition actually occurred, began to occur before the 20th century. This stems from a number of things. I would suggest to you that there's one cataclysmic event of the 20th century that greatly contributed to this transition, and that would be the Nazi era. As I think everyone who's looking at this is aware, the Nazi physicians carried out what they called clinical research, medical research, on prisoners. These were horrendous acts. Uh, that amounted to, to torture and often murder. And after the war was over, when folks started to understand exactly what had happened, when the winners got together in Nuremberg and said, we have to deal with the war criminals of this era, among others, they dealt with the physicians. And at the end of this, they wrote something called the Code of Nuremberg, which again, many of you are familiar with. We're gonna make some rules for medical research because this was such a horrendous violation of medical ethics. We need to make some rules for medical research. So they wrote the Code of Nuremberg. Ten rules. The first rule, the voluntary consent of the human subject is absolutely essential. It's worth noting, by the way, that this rule was passed around the same time as penicillin was made, named, if you will, the drug of choice for the treatment of syphilis. What does syphilis have to do with any of this? Well, I think you probably see where I'm going, which is, the, of course, the Tuskegee experiments, where African-American men with syphilis were never told that they had syphilis, but they were being followed over the course of years and even decades to understand the natural course of this disease. They were never told their diagnosis. They were never offered the various treatments that were available. And when an effective treatment such as penicillin became available, they weren't offered that either. And this went on for decades after the Code of Nuremberg. The point is twofold. 
One is that this isn't just about physicians thousands of miles away. This is about closer to home. This is about risks in our culture. And there are examples since uh, Nuremberg and since Tuskegee as well. Maybe not quite as egregious, um, but certainly these problems persist. And we all need to be aware of that and to be alert to those sorts of things. Nuremberg in general didn't catch on right away. In 1947, all of a sudden clinical research wasn't carried out in a fashion that we would all consider perfectly consistent with the ideas brought forth then. But over the course of decades, clinical research did change. The rules for clinical research changed. And these ideas actually transitioned over into clinical medicine as well, with the basic idea that the voluntary consent of the human subject is essential, or the voluntary consent of the patient is absolutely essential. Of course, here we're talking about adults of sound mind, but this idea carries through. From this idea, we get the doctrine of informed consent, which you're all pretty familiar with. Keep in mind that informed consent is known in pediatrics more properly as informed permission. One gives consent for oneself, one gives permission for one's baby to have this procedure. But we use the term informed consent uh, for babies as well. Whether that's correct or not, I can't say, but we do. The, the message is still largely the same. Informed consent and parental authority. Informed consent has four elements. The first will be provision of information. What information are we obligated to give to the parents in the NICU? The diagnosis and the situation. What treatments or tests are we proposing? What are the risks and benefits of that proposed treatment? And what are the alternate approaches that they might consider, including no treatment? And what are the risks and benefits we would anticipate with those alternatives? Now, this can be looked at in really two ways. Because we can't give all the possible information that's relevant. And people often say this. They say, we can't give all the information, so what should we give? Well, there's two schools of thought on this. Traditionally, uh, the, the granting of information has been physician-oriented, which is to say, what would a reasonable physician do? What's the standard of care? I would encourage you to think about a more contemporary approach to this, which is patient-oriented. Not just what would a reasonable physician disclose, but what would a reasonable person or parent in this circumstance want to know? Next, we talk about assessment of the patient's understanding as the second component of informed consent. Assessment, if only tacit, of the capacity of the patient, or in our case, of course, of the surrogate of the parent, to make necessary decisions. And assurance insofar as possible that they are free to choose without coercion. What alternatives do you have to discuss when you have a treatment in mind that you want to present to parents? I would suggest to you that all ethically acceptable alternatives, including the alternative of no treatment, if that's ethically acceptable by your lights, should be discussed with parents. What makes something an ethically acceptable alternative? It offers potential to benefit the patient. If it's feasible, if it can be done, it should be offered. This should include treatment that's available from other physicians and at other hospitals. If you don't do something at your hospital, but they do it five miles away and transfer to that hospital is feasible and it's something the parents want, they deserve to know that this is available. I once heard a very good physician say in a conversation about cases like this, you know, if the parents ask, we talked about different options in a given disease state, uh, and he said, you know, if the parents asked for that, I would do it, but I would never offer it. There's a fundamental problem with this. I would suggest to you that what you need to offer includes all options, all options that are ethically acceptable, including ones that you wouldn't necessarily recommend, but ones you'd be willing to do. Otherwise, you get it that there's a bit of a savviness requirement. If the parents are really good with the internet, or if they have a relative in neonatology, they're gonna know about those other options. But if not, they're not gonna know about those other options. And it's not really fair that one group is given an option that another group is not, simply based on how savvy they are with regard to medicine. Now, patient autonomy, um, which we talked about as the first principle, this is important for you to understand as one of the basics of medical ethics, but patient autonomy um, is not an option for us, right? Our babies can't make autonomous choices. And so people will often refer to parental autonomy. That's okay, they have parental autonomy. But parental autonomy is itself a misnomer. You can't have self-rule over someone else. The more appropriate term would be parental authority. And there's a well-recognized rights of parents in our society uh, and dating back to antiquity to control what happens to their children, to have authority over what happens to their kid. I wanna to suggest to you that patient autonomy and parental authority are not exactly the same. And for that, I wanna consider the case of Mrs. Smith. Mrs. Smith uh, teaches middle school in our town. We all know her well. She's 29 years old, smart woman. She was in an automobile accident. Um, she was taken to the hospital right away, and the folks in the ER said, Mrs. Smith, you're in a terrible car accident. She says, yes, I know. We say, you've suffered terrible injuries. Yes, I know. We have to take you to the operating room right away to save your life. She says, okay, go. Let's do it. 
And I said, also, we have to give you a transfusion. She says, wait, stop, no transfusion. It's against my religion, I think this is wrong. Now, we say, well, Mrs. Smith, you're gonna die without this transfusion. She says, I don't want the transfusion. Now, assuming Mrs. Smith is of sound mind, does she have a right to refuse that transfusion? In fact, she does. We can look to Mr. Smith who's standing there. We don't look to him to overrule her because he doesn't really have the right to overrule her. But he may say, oh, I don't know, she didn't believe that this morning, then maybe there's more of a brain injury here in this accident than we thought. But the fact of the matter is, if she's of sound mind, she has the right to refuse even life-saving treatment. That's patient autonomy. Our respecting that right is respect for autonomy. Well, a minute later, an ambulance comes in, and who's in that ambulance but Junior Smith, two-year-old son of Mrs. Smith. Mrs. Smith, this is Junior Smith. She goes, I know, he was in the car with me. He has the same injuries. Okay, so what should we do? Well, we have to take him to the operating room right away to save his life. She says, okay, go. And we say, and he needs a transfusion to save his life. And she says, absolutely not. It's against my religion. It's offensive to God. Now, I think, without getting into too much detail, I think you guys know that we separate. That's where patient autonomy and parental authority starts to split. We say Mrs. Smith has a right to refuse this life-saving therapy for herself, but she doesn't necessarily have the right to refuse it for her child. And I think most of you would recognize a responsibility to seek to override that opinion. This is not something just unique to us in, as neonatologists. Indeed, the Supreme Court, now over a generation ago, in a case that was not exactly similar to this, but related ultimately to religious freedom, said something terribly important in a case called Prince v. Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And what the Supreme Court said was parents are free to become martyrs themselves, but it does not follow that they're free in identical circumstances to make martyrs of their children before they have reached the age of full and legal discretion when they can make that choice for themselves. There are limits to parental authority. Now, the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics has, has published excellent opinions on this, and it comes down to this, that parents should be given wide latitude about life-saving, life-sustaining medical treatment, about decisions in that realm. But we should seek to overrule them, their decisions, a parental refusal specifically, that's clearly opposed to the child's best interest. Or a decision that, or if they're refusing a treatment that would likely prevent significant harm, suffering, or death. Those refusals we should seek to overrule. So there is, parental authority is very strong, but it is not absolute. There's some threshold. Now, this is basically we talked about the child's best interest and how you know, we want the surrogate decision maker to decide based on the child's best interest. Now, if things are like this and the parents choose this option, what I'd say is that they have that right and we should respect that right. If it's the dramatic difference and they're choosing something that's clearly opposed to the child's best interest or they're refusing something that would likely prevent significant harm, suffering, or death, at that point we shouldn't simply accept that refusal. This is my suggestion to you. Now, the best interest, we talk about how we balance benefits and burdens, right? We have various benefits and burdens that can be considered. There's the chance of survival. There's the benefits of survival. There's the pain associated with the proposed treatment. And there's also concerns, something which you'll hear a lot about, right? Quality of life. And this is often referenced. This is often referenced when we're trying to make decisions in the intensive care unit. This, again, it becomes terribly subjective. Many of you are familiar with, all of you should become familiar with, the work of a doctor named Segal up in Canada, Saroj Segal. And it's very interesting, and, and to put it simply, she asked uh, the pediatricians of teenagers, former very small preemies, who had some disabilities, what's this kid's quality of life? And the pediatrician said, it's here. Well, they asked the parents of those same kids, and they said, well, it's here. They asked the kids themselves, now adolescents, and they said, it's here. The point being, our assessment of quality of life is very subjective, and we have to be keenly aware that our values might not be shared by the parents or eventually by the patients themselves. Nevertheless, we have a role in locating that threshold when what the parents are refusing is clearly opposed to the child's best interest. Um, we have to determine if we've gone past that threshold, in which case we have to seek to override the parental choice. Other ethical approaches and considerations. Now there's some other approaches and considerations which we consider apart from those principles that we talked about. Um, you should, the, the four principles are most commonly quoted and referenced when we have these discussions. And it's important for us to have these discussions because Remember, neonatology is a team sport. You're not doing this alone. And as such, when we sit and talk about what should we do with this particular patient in this particular circumstance, what should we or should we not make available to the parents? Um, if you're deciding based on your moral intuition, what you learned from your mother and father and the culture you grew up in, uh, 
And I'm deciding based on my moral intuition, what I learned from my mother and father and the culture I grew up in, and the TV shows I saw, and the books you read, and so on and so forth, that's going to be a very different language. It's going to be we're never going to quite get together. It's going to be very hard for you to convince me by telling me that your father would have disapproved, or for me to convince you telling you that my mother would have disapproved. We've got to find that common language. And one aspect of that common language becomes those four principles. Respect for autonomy, or for us, respect for parental authority. Right? Obligation of beneficence, the obligation of non-maleficence, and the obligations related to justice. But there's another school of thought completely. There are other schools of thought completely. For example, feminist ethics, which specifically talks about issues related to groups that have traditionally experienced oppression or domination, such as women, ethnic minorities, the poor, and yes, children. But also within the feminist ethics tradition, there's an emphasis on the importance of relationships and there, a feminist ethics perspective on how we should act in making decisions for these kids includes an understanding that these children are going to live within the web of a family, that this, 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 there's already um, a network of relationships that are going to be crucially important to this child's life, that are crucially important to the parents' lives, and that these things are, are, have to be taken into consideration when we make decisions. There's also another school which we'll call virtue ethics, right, which comes from Aristotle and others, which suggests that desirable virtues rather than guiding principles should be what lead us through our medical decisions. This emphasizes certain qualities or characteristics thought to be essential for a good person or a good physician. Virtues like truthfulness, fairness, integrity, compassion, but also virtues like courage and fortitude. I mean, for decision making, a virtue ethics asks, what would a virtuous person do? And the action that we take appropriately follows from that thinking, though it is admittedly somewhat circular, because of course what a virtuous person would do is the, the right thing to do, and what the right thing to do is what a virtuous person would do. So you can, there is a circular component to this. Nevertheless, the value of honesty, of compassion, um, certainly can't be uh, overestimated. Let's talk for a minute about conflicts that so often come up in the newborn intensive care unit. And when we approach them, I want you to consider perhaps a rights-based understanding, another way to look at these things. If we consider some of the relevant rights the child has a right to treatment, specifically treatment likely to benefit the child, right? But the parent has a right to decide. They have a right to raise their children as they see fit. Now sometimes, sometimes the rights of the child will trump the rights of the parents to decide. In the example of Mrs. Smith, many would argue that indeed the child's right to the life-saving transfusion trumps the mother's right to decide on his behalf. But there's other rights involved in here too, because there's the other side of the coin. Most of the problems you face in the newborn ICU will likely not be, these kinds of conflicts I mean, will likely not be parents refusing treatment that you feel is essential. More often than that, I think you'll encounter situations where parents are requesting or even demanding treatment that you think are inappropriate or even unethical. There's another right you have to consider, which is the child's right to mercy. Not something that you see as much of, but that I think, I mean, I would define this as the child's right not to be made to undergo medical treatments or procedures that are painful, invasive, and offer no benefit to the child. So sometimes the parent's right to decide, to demand, if you will, a certain treatment course, will be trumped, I believe, by the child's right to mercy. And you can probably think examples of this. Where parents want you to perform a surgical procedure that offers no real benefit to the child, you're not going to do that. Parents want you to put a chest tube into a child who has minutes to live no matter what you do. You may say, I'm not going to put the child through this in his last minutes of life because it can't help him. In that case, the child's right to mercy will trump the parent's right to decide by your lights. Now remember, the flip side of rights is always obligations. So if the parents have a right for something or the child has a right, often it carries with it an obligation on our part to help preserve those rights. I would suggest to you that there are some justifications for refusing a parental request. And I would put those justifications, I would say there are four. You may come up with others. But I would encourage you to come up with your list of reasons that you think justify saying no to a parental request for a specific treatment. And it has to be something more than because we say so or because we sat around on the table and decided. What are the justifications? Justifications might consist of futility. If this can't possibly accomplish the desired goal, and people argue in their medical ethics over what futility means, which is why the whole futility argument has lost some, some of its uh, uh, juice within the medical ethics community, but I would say, in its purest form, it still retains some strength. If something can't accomplish the desired goal, then I don't think it's something you're obligated to do. Uh, feasibility would be the similar argument. There's an ethical adage, essentially, that says ought implies can. You can't be obligated to do something 
if you can't do it. If someone insists that you save their child born at 20 weeks, note that this is being filmed in the year 2015, so if someone insists that you resuscitate their child born at 20 weeks, and you're certain of the dates of 20 weeks, I'm telling you, you can't actually successfully resuscitate that child. Therefore, you cannot be obligated to resuscitate that child because ought implies can. In addition to this, again, distributive justice may be the reason why families are refused something they request. But ultimately, where the, where the action will be most of the time is, and I've already erased it, is patient's best interest. Is if a clear discrepancy between the benefits and balance, a clear imbalance, I should say, between benefits and burdens, such that what's being requested, the burdens clearly outweigh the benefits to the child, then I think that's a justification for refusing the parental request. But the reasons for the denial should be explained to the families. And we've got to avoid magic words. Why won't you do it? Well, because he's not a candidate. What does that mean? Well, it's not indicated. Well, why is it indicated? Well, he's not a candidate. I suggest instead a conversation based primarily on the benefits and burdens of the treatment in question to the child. Your conflict resolution is certainly going to improve conflict prevention. That's the best way. And that's involved, among other things, in establishing a good relationship with the families ahead of time. I recognize that with short rotations through the newborn ICU, very often the families that we're dealing with, we've not had time to establish a good relationship. I would encourage you, if you can, get someone involved who does have such a relationship. For example, the primary pediatrician for the family, if this is not the first child. Possibly the obstetrician, if he, has or he or she has a good relationship with the parents. Communication, which we do not just by speaking, but also by listening. If they want something that we think is inappropriate or unreasonable, we need to hear them out and try and understand why. And we need to take our time and patiently explain why we think it's the wrong thing to do. Ultimately, rule number five of neonatology, maybe we'll make another video someday and I'll teach you the other four. Rule number five of neonatology is ask for help. In this case, you should consider an ethics consultation if parents continue to insist on something that you think is inappropriate or unethical. We also have to apply to these problems a healthy dose of professional humility. And when I refer to professional humility, I'm really referring to three things. One is admit what you don't know. Do you really know what the outcome of this or that considered treatment would be? Are you sure? Have you really looked at the data? Have you considered the weaknesses of the data? We've got to admit what we don't know in terms of prognosis, in terms of what to do next sometimes. We have to be honest. And of course, honesty begins with being honest with ourselves. First, it begins with being honest with myself, then being honest with my colleagues when we try to craft a policy for a specific disease entity. What is our policy or approach going to be with regard to kids born at uh, borderline viability or kids born with trisomy 13 or 18 or hypoplastic left heart? These are difficult questions, which starts with being honest with ourselves and with each other about what we do and don't know about the data. The second component of professional humility is admitting what you can't do. And I think that speaks for itself. And the third component, which is very important, is being honest about our motives. Being honest about our motives. First honest with ourselves, then we can be honest with the people around them. And I refer to this specifically with regard to an old football coach whose name most of you have heard, Vince Lombardi. He's credited um, with being one of the first coaches to make his player, forgive the sidetrack to football, but you'll see where I'm going. He is credited with being the first coach to make his players run and run and run in practice. Now in those days, this goes back again decades, football was thought of as a strength sport and a skill sport, not so much an endurance sport. Why did he make these guys run so much? And they asked him and he said, I don't want these guys ever to get tired in a game because fatigue makes cowards of us all. Fatigue makes cowards of us all. Am I refusing a parental request to start or continue with a child with a very difficult prognosis? Am I refusing because it's, it can't be done? Am I refusing because it's clearly opposed to the child's best interest? Or am I refusing because I'm exhausted, either with this child or with the overall situation in the unit? Now, the first two are reasonable justifications, I would suggest. The third I would suggest to you is not. It's absolutely human, it's absolutely understandable, but it does not a justification, our own exhaustion, for refusing a parental request to try something to save their child. The final thought I'd like to leave you with is one of moral agency. You are, we are moral agents, which is to say we're responsible for our actions. We're responsible for what goes on in that newborn ICU. We cannot defer ultimately to, well, 
I knew it was the wrong thing to do, but the parents asked me to. I knew it was the wrong thing to do, but my attending asked me to. Now, I think, I'm speaking now, I believe, to neonatology fellows, I want you to do 99% of what your attending asks you to do. Um, finding that other 1%, and we're talking about ethical situations now. Finding that other 1%, ah, that's the hard ethical work, which you have to do. You are moral agents. You've got to find that situation. Now, if in the end you look back and you say, I didn't realize what we were doing was wrong, I think that's understandable. And in the end, if you look back and say, I knew what we were doing was wrong, but I didn't speak up, that's a mistake. You're not going to want to be in that situation. If you have concerns about where you're at ethically in the treatment of a child, you need to speak up. Of course, speak up in the appropriate setting. Of course, speak up with respect for your attendings and for your peers and for the parents and everybody else. But remember, you're moral agents. You are responsible for your actions. So if there's a problem, speak up. And I thank you for your attention. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback.